so this uh, ex examination is uh, over right so the governor heard the door clang for the for last time the examination was over how did he get on do you think asked stephens as he walked beside mcclinney to the main gates so stephens who had been instructed by a phone call to escort escort mcclinney out so when he was uh, said uh, when he was like taking him out of the main gates then he asked him like how did he do how did he get on do you think oh i can i can think he distinguished himself so that uh, mcclinney the invigilator is saying that uh, i don't think he has uh, done any good i'm afraid his scots accent seemed broader than ever and his long black overcoat reaching almost to his knees fostered the illusion that he had suddenly grown grown slimmer now when mcclinney spoke you know then we have been given some hints what hints have been given to us like uh, see that mcclinney when he is speaking then his scot accent seemed broader like uh, when i when you speak in your particular language when you speak in your native language you have your natural accent but when you overdo with the accent then you either you, then it sounds a little different also. so now his scot accent had seemed to broader than earlier and secondly the long black overcoat which reached almost to his knees that gave an illusion that he had become slimmer it's not possible that somebody becomes slimmer slim somebody gets slimmer within two hours but the way his coat had reached till knees you know that was giving an illusion that he had become a little bit slimmer his accent had changed and uh, he was you know looking a bit slimmer so this illusion was it uh, you can say realistic or was it did it have some purpose got it so let's see i have already told you like this play in the zero you know, chapter the writer or in next year you know because it's a detective story so he has tried to distract the readers to give us false you know uh, false judgments so this thing here mcleary has been made to we have been given a clue that maybe this is not mcleary this is what the writer wants to say right stephen spect pleased that the governor had asked him and not jackson to see mcleary of the premises so when this uh, jackson was doing this thing uh, when stephen was asked to see of mcleary then he was feeling proud that he was given this bi duty because he was a junior to jackson so when a junior is given uh, a better uh, he is given a vip duty thereby ignoring the junior senior one then <coughs> then the junior becomes proud so that was very natural so the point over here is then uh, that instead of you know focusing upon duty uh, this person you know is becoming a little bit you can say uh, self conscious so this kind of feeling makes you distracted you can't do your duty that efficiently as you should be and all in the morning had gone pretty well means everything had gone well but something stopped him from making his way directly to the canteen for a belated cup of coffee so stephen straight away wanted to go to the canteen to have a cup of coffee he wanted to take just one last look at events it was like a program he had seen on tv about a woman who could never really convince herself that she had locked the front door when she had gone to bed so there is an example the writer is giving like uh, at this time what was basically going on stephen had uh, had given uh, that mcleary a uh, send off he had seen him off he had told him bye bye and all when coming back he wanted to go to have a cup of coffee in the canteen but before that he felt like going to the prison and uh, finally see whether ivan was safely sitting there or not so he had that feeling it was like that woman whose program he might have seen on tv that woman who is never sure whether she had locked the front door before going to bed or not so he also wanted to be finally convinced that ivan was safely secure in his room so finally he went to see ivan in his room so often she would get up got up 12 15 sometimes 20 times to check the board he re entered the wing 
made his way along to Ivan's cell and opened the peep hole once more. Oh no, Christ, no! There sprawled back in Ivan's chair was a man. For a semi-second, Stephen thought it must be Ivan's, a grey regulation blanket slipping from his shoulders. The front of his closely cropped, irregularly tufted hair, a wash with fierce red blood, which had dripped already through his small black beard and was even now spreading horribly over the white clerical collar and down into the black clerical front. So what, what he saw in the in that cell where Evans was supposed to be there, there he saw that it was not Evans, but it was McLeary uh, who almost looked like Evans. And you people can make out like why for an instance, if he looked like Evans only. Uh, see, because of this very McLeary had close cropped hair, that what we had also seen when McLeary had come, that he had close cropped hair. And secondly, uh, McLeary was wearing that uh, black collar, uh, right? See this? He was uh, wearing uh, a white clerical collar down into the black clerical front. So he was wearing that long coat white clerical collar. So what he saw, like he saw that uh, at that time it, that it was not, it, the person seemed like Evans, but he was McLeary, the one whose uh, head, uh, one who was bleeding profusely from head. See this? Uh, he, uh, blanket was slipping from his shoulders. In the front of his closely cropped, irregularly tufted gray hair, a wash with fierce spread blood. So from his head, blood was coming out. And that blood had almost dipped his beard as well as a propeller. So the point is that he had been hit hard. McLeary had been hit hard. So already what we have seen on red, that McLeary had already been sent out. He had been sent bye-bye. And uh, when McLeary was going out, then we were told by the author that his accent was louder. And secondly, uh, he seemed to be as if he had become slimmer. So now inside the cell, McLeary was badly injured. So what is the indication given to us that the person who had gone, that maybe he was Evans and McLeary has been left behind. Got it. But the point is, how could it happen? That we have to find out. So now the person who was badly injured inside was McLeary, not Evans. Where was Evans? Where was Evans? We have been told by this, uh, you know, description that Evans has gone out. Okay, and it was Evans was very, uh, you know, he had he was sent off with honors. He did not have to run away. He was sent out of the jail with honors. Okay, he was given a warm send off. So now, are these things as it is what we have read, or uh, will there be some, you know? Uh, deception. Will there be something uh, else? Let's see. Stephens shouted wildly for Jackson and the words appeared to penetrate the curtain of blood that veiled McLeary's ears. So Stephens shouted wildly for Jackson and the words appeared to penetrate the curtain of blood that veiled McLeary's ears. For the minister's hand felt feebly for a handkerchief from his pocket and held it to his bleeding head, the blood seeping slowly through the white linen. So Stephens, you know, he called out uh, this uh, Jackson, and at that time that McLeary was, took out a handkerchief from his pocket, and he started cleaning the blood. And that white linen handkerchief soaked the, started soaking the blood. Now that this white linen, is, does it remind you of something, children? Are you reminded of something from this white linen? Hmm? Any clue? Do you remember that when this uh, boy, when this Evans was asked to smarten himself, he was given a handkerchief. It was a white linen handkerchief he was given. Got it? And now the same kind of handkerchief is with this McNeely also. Any idea? Any Anything you people are getting? So we have been told clearly what is like visible now, Visib the things visible to everybody is that this is McLeary and Evans has gone out, right? But 
is that the fact? Is this really McLeary? Do you think it is really McLeary? This also you must make out like whether this is really McLeary or not. But Jackson and all the police officers, they would be considering him a McLeary only because he's looking like McLeary. What makes him look like McLeary? Because of his close cut hair, because of the blood which is coming out and the blood has covered his beard also. Which beard? The, the kind of beard which McLeary also had. Okay. And moreover, this way McLeary is covered with blanket. Earlier, who had that blanket? The blanket was given to events. Then how did this McLeary have this blanket? So all these are these things, these things are all indicating at one thing that this very person who is posing to be McLeary is actually Evans Kobe. What makes me say this? Because the white linen handkerchief was with Evans. Evans was wearing a hat which he wanted, which he said like it was his lucky charm. Actually, before coming for to examination with the razor with which he was to shave himself, with that razor he might have cut his hair. And nobody knew that he was having that short hair. Because so far, this till this examination, Evans had long hair. And the governor and the Stephens, they all had been telling him to go and get a hair cut. And everybody who used to get irritated with his long hair. So before this examination, Evans was supposed to have long hair. But when did he get the short hair? Nobody knew. Because he had come to this examination with the, with the hat. And just all of a sudden now, this Evans coming up or appearing to be the one with short hair and uh, beard. And how did he have that beard? And how did he have those clerical collars and all? Because uh, during the last five years when uh, Stephens was asked to attend a phone call outside, at that time the final makeup was done. Okay. What does final makeup I mean? The hat was removed, the beard was put in, and the clerical collar was also put in. So all these things were given the final touch-ups during the last five minutes. Okay, when Stephen was asked to attend a phone call. And uh, who's that final call was, that also we are going to read, uh, read very soon. So Stephen shouted wildly for Jackson and the words appeared to penetrate the curtain of blood. So uh, is the real blood uh, that thick, children? If the blood really starts uh, spouting down from head to you know, neck, then does the blood happen to be that thick? Here the curtain of blood had covered his ears, for the minister's hand felt feebly for a handkerchief and he held it out to his bleeding head. The blood seeping slowly through the white linen, it gave a long, he gave a long low moan and tried to speak, but his voice trailed away and by the time Jackson had arrived and dispatched Stephens to ring the police and the ambulance, the handkerchief was a sticky, squelchy bodge of cloth. So, if does blood become that sticky? Is the real blood that sticky, children? No. So, with the white, that white linen handkerchief had almost become a squelchy bodge of cloth because of the blood. It doesn't happen to be with the real blood. Now, uh, McLeary slowly raised himself and his face twisted tightly with pain. Uh, don't, uh, don't worry about the ambulance, man. I'm right, I'm right. Get the police. I know, I know where he. So McLeary now is again speaking in Scott accent. Natural Scott accent. Okay, so he says, don't worry. Uh, don't worry about the ambulance, man. I am alright, but I know where that man has gone. He closed his eyes and another drip of blood splashed like a huge raindrop on the wooden floor. So he then, uh, uh, you know, he closed his eyes and uh, a huge drop of blood fell on the floor. So when uh, somebody is actually bleeding, does the blood fall like a drop of, you know, like a big drop? Okay, so there was something wrong with the blood also. Let's see. His unclosed eyes, he closed his eyes and another drip of blood splashed like a huge red raindrop on the wooden floor. His hand fell along the table found the German question paper and grasped it tightly in his blood-stained hand. Get the governor. I know, I know where he was. <clears throat> so now this McLeary is, is, is pretending as if he wants to help the police in finding where Evans has gone. Right? 
Almost immediately, sirens were sounding. Prison officers barked orders. Puzzled prisoners pushed their way along the corridors. Doors were banged and bolted, and phones were ringing everywhere. And within a minute, McLeary, with Jackson and Stephen supporting him on either side, his face now streaked and caked with the drying blood, was greeted in the prison yard by the governor. So now this very McLeary, uh, who was imposing as if he wanted to help the police, now he was brought in front of the governor, and at the time he was supported by both Stephen and uh, Jacks because he was injured, and his face was all covered with blood and. Uh, uh, making it difficult for the others to recognize him very closely. We must get you to the hospital. I just don't. Uh, you've called the police? Yes, yes, they are on their way, but I'm all right. I'm all right. Look, look here. Awkwardly, he opened the German question paper and thrust it before the governor's face. It's there. Do you see what, what I mean? So, this uh, McLeary is uh, telling the governor, like, uh, the question paper is here and try to make, decode this. The governor looked down and realized what McLeary was trying to tell him. A photocopied sheet had been carefully and cleverly superimposed over the last originally blank page of the question paper. So what did the what did McLeary show governor? The McLeary showed governor that the last page of the blank blank question paper was superimposed by something else. <clears throat> yeah, see what they have done, governor? Yeah, you see. His voice trailed off again as a governor dredging the layers of long neglected learning, built himself to translate the German text before him. So at this time, when McLeary told the governor to like, see what they have done, then the governor was trying to read what was written over there. At that time, the McLeary's voice trailed off. So he was becoming weaker. So he was getting fainting, fainted. So something in German is written and uh, then German, that this very man will point, uh, you must follow the plan already uh, something. The vital point in, in time is three minutes before the end of the examination, but something, 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 something. Don't hit him too hard. Remember, he is a minister and don't overdo the Scots accent when. So this is what is written in German in the last, uh, you know, page of the question paper. What was written over there in the last page of the question paper? So children, here is a, this was something which was written on the last page of question paper. And uh, uh, in the last page of that paper, Evans was instructed as to what he should do. He was told that uh, the most important time is the last three minutes before the end of the examination. Uh, but something is to be done, but don't hit him too hard. Who is here? McLeary. So Evans was instructed not to hit uh, McLeary very hard because he's a minister. And don't do overdo the accent. So he was given the instruction that when he will be leaving the jail, then don't uh, don't give Scott accent um, overdose. Otherwise, uh, you will be uh, found out. Okay, a fast approaching siren wailed to, to its crescendo. The great doors of the prison yard were pushed back, and a white police car squealed to a jerky halt beside them. So then a police van came. Detective Superintendent Carter swung himself out of the passenger seat and saluted the governor. So the Detective Superintendent Carter came and he saluted the governor. What the hell is happening, sir? And turning to McLeary, Christ, who hit him? But McLeary cut across whatever expedition the governor might be. Uh, whatever expedition the governor might have given. But McLeary cut across. So McLeary interrupted him. Uh, Elsfield Bay officer, I know where Evans. He was breathing heavily and leaned for support against the side of the car, where the imprint of his hand was left in tarnished crimson. So then, uh, whose hand was already full of blood, you know? Uh, he told him that, uh, take me to the Elsfield Bay because I know where that gas might have run off. So he was pretending as if he was going to fall. So he took the support of the car. And when his hand touched the car, the great red, tarnished red colored you know, mark was left on it. It doesn't happen with the real blood. So in bewilderment, Carter looked to the governor for guidance. What? Take him with you. If you think he will be all right, he's the only one who seems to know what's happening. So governor is telling Carter to take him with, you, with him because he only knows what is happening. So see, the governor is telling the superintendent 
that this person knows very well spider law so this is the law these are the authorities work like this the carter opened the back door and helped mcleary inside and within a few seconds the car went away in a spurt of gravel else field way mcleary had said and there it was starting up at the governor sorry and there it was staring up at the governor from the last few lines of the german text so mcleary who had been pointing out towards elsfield way and the governor looked at the question paper again and he said from elsfield way drive to the headington roundabout where yes of course the examination board was in elsfield way and someone from the board must have been involved in the escape plan from the very beginning the question paper itself the corrections paper so now this governor is able to make out that the examination center that even the people in examination were also involved in making evans run away so they have been there right from the beginning so the governor turned to jackson and stevens i don't need to tell you what's happened do i his voice sounded almost calm in its scathing contempt and which one of you two morons was it who took evans for a little nice little walk to the main gates and waved him bye bye so now he is coming to the point he says like who who from you people took him uh, to see him off it was me sir stammered uh, stephens just like you told me uh, what just like i told you what the hell when you rang sir uh, and told me when was that the governor's voice was a bit harsh now so governor was like totally aghast now because he he had never made a call so you know sir about 20 past 11 just before you blithering idiot man it wasn't me who rang you don't you realize but what was the use he had used the telephone at that time but only to try uh, to get through to the examination board so at 11:25 the governor was trying to uh, call examination but he could not because the call was going busy so then where was the call examination call center was had called stephens at the time so the call which stephen got at 11:25 to escort mcleary out that call was not from governor side that call was from the examination side so that was a hoax okay he took he shook his head in growing despair and turned on the senior prison officer as for you jackson how long have you been pretending you've been wrong you've got a brain well i'll tell you something jackson your skull is empty absolutely empty so now uh, this governor is holding jackson but he doesn't realize that as much fault is of jackson more than that the fault is of the governor himself because it was he who was managing the whole administrative work how could the, the prisoner under his nose run away how could this happen so it was jackson who had spent two hours in ivan's cell the previous evening and it was jackson who had confit now confidently reported that there was nothing hidden away here nothing at all and yet ivan had somehow managed to conceal not only a false beard a pair of spectacles a dog collar and the rest of the clerical paraphernalia but also some sort of weapon with which he had hit, he had given mcleary such a terrible blow across the head so now the governor pointed out that uh, jack it was basically he said that it was basically the jackson who was to be blamed because he had spent the previous evening for two hours for two hours he was with jack uh, evans and secondly in the morning it was he only who had given the report that now evans had nothing dangerous with him but even then evans had been able to manage not only the a weapon with which he had hit mcleary he had also been able to manage a clerical collar a beard and spectacles uh, and coat with which he was able to run away so that is also a question with us like how did both people because one person went earlier the one who goes to be mcleary and the person who was uh, behind the one who was badly injured he was also wearing the same dress which mcleary was wearing how did they have two kinds of dresses together and you might have got the answer have you got the answer or not if not then let's read because it's a detective story all the answers have already been given in the story okay uh, so this from this paragraph it from this paragraph on 84 page we'll be starting tomorrow the last of the chapter is coming up concluding i guess still it will take two more days
So after this, you people all again read the chapter. And tomorrow, before I start from this paragraph, I will ask you the questions like how did that uh, Evans was able to procure all these things with him? How did these things come with the Evans or so called the McLean? Got it? So tomorrow, be ready to answer some questions. So we read it from the uh, detective point of view. Okay.